Okay, we're going to get started this evening. Welcome everybody to uh, Virtual Playhouse. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm the Director of Development Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. I um, want to thank you all for, uh, for tuning in tonight for what is going to be a really fascinating conversation uh, about a really, really great book. Um, for those of you who have read it, uh, I'm sure that you have a lot of questions uh, for Sam. For those of you who haven't read it, you should definitely run out and get yourselves a copy. It's a really, really great read. Um, very quick, uh, very, very enjoyable book. Uh, a couple of very quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, for those of you who are, might be using Zoom for the first time or are not that familiar with it in this format, uh, you should all should have um, at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or near the top of your screen if you're on an iPad, there's a Q&A button. Um, please feel free at any point to ask a question using the Q&A. Um, after, uh, after they talk for a little bit, John and Sam will take your questions. Uh, and you can submit them through the Q&A feature. Um, we are at the Bedford Playhouse currently closed. Uh, our doors are shut due to social distancing. Uh, so we ask, uh, as always, if you enjoy this evening uh, and you find uh, you'd like to see more programming like this, that you take a moment before you shut your computers down and go to our website, bedfordplayhouse.org, uh, and consider making a donation uh, to help support us uh, in this period uh, there's hopefully a light at the end of the tunnel coming hopefully soon, uh, but in the meantime, we're trying to do as much as we can in a virtual format, and so um, any amount of support is much appreciated. You might also consider becoming a member. Uh, members get discounts on special invitations to all different kinds of events. Uh, we do curbside concessions every Friday. Members get discounts on that. Um, again, all of this is on our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org, and uh, we thank you very much for um, your support in that. All right, without any further ado, uh, we're going to introduce uh, our founder, Playhouse founder, uh, John Farr, who is your moderator for this evening. And I'd like to invite John to come on now, and he will uh, get the festivities rolling. Hey, Here guys. I am. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Dan. Uh, really excited to be here tonight. Um, I am thrilled to introduce Sam Wasson, a fabulous writer who writes mainly about filmmakers and, and filmmaking, which is our favorite topic here at Playhouse. Um, I, I've always been, I've been a fan of his for quite a few years now, ever since picking up his book, Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m., Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and the Dawn of the Modern Woman. Uh, I basically picked it up uh, and I never put it down. It's that good. So if you haven't um, read it, you should. I recommend it to you. And his new book, which of course I've also read, The Big Goodbye, Chinatown and the Last Years of Hollywood, is also a real tour de force, detailing a fascinating transitional period in the movie business, uh, as well as the making of a true masterpiece. So uh, I know you can applaud virtually wherever you are, and so please do that as we welcome Sam Wasson. Oh, hello. There he is. Hi. How are you? Well, I'm good. Uh, and I'm, you're in I'm, LA, so it's all yeah. it's, it's nice out there. Well, it's nice, but we're under curfew. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's nice at my house. It's a good place to be. <laughs> Better than the White House. Uh, but we, yeah. we won't go. We won't go there. Um, so you I'm going to jump. <laughs> I'm going to jump right in. Um, what was the genesis of this particular project, Sam? Is this something you wanted to do for a long time? I assume the White that House. Part. The White House actually was the genesis for this because um, when when um, uh, when Trump won, I turned to my friend Graham, who I was watching the election with, and um, I said, "What's the precedent for this? What's the myth?" What's the um, what story are we going to latch on to to try to give this a frame? And um, and uh, Chinatown came to my mind uh, like pretty soon thereafter that. So I thought, wow, this is the um, this is the moment for Chinatown. But I don't think Donald Trump is anywhere near as cool as Noah Cross. That's my personal feeling. He's he's about as evil, <laughs> but but um, maybe not as snazzy. No, no, he's no. Not he's as glamorous evil. and as evil. No, he's not as glamorous. I don't think no, so. No. So the the seventies, the the period that you're covering was obviously a trans 
transformational period in Hollywood. Uh, that's been written about before, but you wrote about it in a very personal way, really talking about four key characters, the producer, Robert Evans, the director, Roman Polanski, Jack Nicholson, and, and the writer, Robert Town. It, it wasn't clear. Did you actually get to interview all of them? No. Um, I interviewed Evans and, and Polanski. Um, I did not interview uh, Town or uh, Jack. Mm. I'm curious as to why Jack would not want to be interviewed about, about this. I don't know if Jack's doing interviews so much, so many interviews right now. I spoke to Sandy Bressler, his agent, and Bressler said to me, you know, Jack just is going to, he's not doing a lot of interviews. Yeah. And uh, I said, all right, that's okay. He's, yeah. he's been on the record pretty uh, voluminously about this period. So um, there's was, you know, more than enough. It was just disappointing that I didn't get to, you know, shake his hand. Um, and the same for town. You know, he's this movie has been famous for 40 years, 45 years. 40 yeah. Years? For now, 45 years. 45 74. years. Yeah. So um, so all these guys are, are on the record. Um, um, uh, so, in fact, the only two who weren't so much on the record were the guys that I I got. Yeah, and you got Robert Evans, obviously, before he, he just recently passed away. Yes, and of course I got, I spoke with many other people who've never been on the record before about this movie. Um, yeah. Uh, and I love the Silberts were one of the Richard Silbert and Anthea Silbert. Are they both, I'm sorry, are they alive? I should know that. Anthea is alive and in Greece as we speak. She lives in Greece. Anthea Silbert was a costume designer, the yes. sister-in-law of uh, Richard Silbert, who is the yeah. great production designer. He production designed The Graduate and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and Carnal Knowledge, those Mike, Mike Nichols movies, and then uh, Rosemary for Roman and, and uh, obviously Chinatown. How, uh, what was your take on Polanski? Uh, he, is he bitter about uh, what happened with regard to not being able to return to America? He feels that an injustice has been done him somehow. Yeah, I, and and I understand that he is a, as he says, he is a fugitive from injustice. Yeah. Uh, uh, which isn't to say that uh, he wasn't guilty of a crime. Um, yeah. He certainly was, and a terrible crime, and um, confessed to that. And in in the um, plea deal with the um, the judge, the the both both Polanski's team and the, the, the prosecution made an agreement. Everyone was agreed. And then the judge reneged on that agreement. So uh, that's pretty unjust. Um, and uh, there was really nothing Polanski could do. I really don't know what I would have done in that situation. Yeah, and it was, it was almost like he didn't officially renege. It just came through the pipes that he was going to renege, right? I mean, or well, there no, was the he, possibility. Uh, it, it came through the pipes uh, that he was going to renege, and um, he called the lawyers into his office, and 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 both lawyers, and laid out exactly how he wanted this to unfold for the benefit of the press, which yeah. is the reason he reneged in the first place, because he didn't like how the press was portraying him as someone who was, quote, easy on a celebrity. So, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, there you go. Oh, my God. Yeah. Now, the uh, Robert Evans, fascinating character. Yes. Uh, 74 was one of the best years for Paramount Pictures, and yet he gets fired as studio head. Right. Um, and so that that always, I mean, and you, we, you talk about it in the film, but was there part of it was that he wanted to be fired? I mean, in other words, he was obviously better as a producer than he was a studio head, and he must have enjoyed it a lot more. So was it more of a mutual thing, or I mean, I should have picked it up, but you, I'd love you to talk about that. Yeah, no, that was a great that was a great point. It sh it should be said just to clarify for people who are watching that Evans was in the nearly unique, remarkable position of running a studio and also producing movies at a studio, um, which yeah. is fabulous because he could divert the studio's resources to his own pictures, but of course not so fabulous for those who had the resources diverted away from them. Like Warren Beatty, for instance, was not happy um, that the parallax view was sort of dumped and felt it was because Evans was putting a lot of 
emphasis on Chinatown, which there was validity to. Um, so uh, to answer your question, John, yeah, I mean, Evans was, of course, disappointed because he had reached the height of the summit, but he understood why he was being demoted. And of course, like you said, he's a producer in his heart anyway. He never loved being the businessman. Uh, he never loved that. He really wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, and uh, uh, he could do that, obviously, as a producer more effectively than as a studio head. But this really was, I mean, for all these four people, these amazing four human beings that you focus on, it was, in a sense, their pinnacle. I mean, you can argue, I mean, Polanski made a couple of really, really good movies since, including The Pianist, but uh, Chinatown was special. I don't think that Evans would really, certainly Evans and Town were not going to reach that pinnacle in terms of creative excellence again. Well, Town certainly wasn't. Evans, of course, had produced Godfather 1 and 2. So yeah, but that got, was before, right? Or no, we did, 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 yeah. Yeah, that he did 2. Before, yeah, right, right. yeah. Um, and and um, Jack would have any number of great performances before this, fewer after this, because yes. the, business, the business would change, I think, for the worse. And that's part of why I picked this particular movie. Uh, not so much because I love the movie, uh, but because I think this moment is the moment at which Hollywood became Chinatown. So I really wanted to use yeah. the metaphor of Chinatown to talk about Hollywood and to talk about America and to talk about what was beautiful before Chinatown, before we became Chinatown, and then what it looked like afterwards. Yeah. So I wanted to take a snapshot of the, the, last, the last good moment. You talk about Diller, the arrival of Barry Diller and Michael Eisner, the TV guys. Yeah. And then the release of Jaws and how that was distributed and how it was marketed so that, that almost blanket distribution and a tremendous amount of marketing push uh, behind a film versus the sort of the old slow build technique, uh, all of a sudden they were minting money and that yeah. changed everything forever. And it hasn't changed much since, has it? No, it hasn't changed much since. And, and the problem with this is not the minting of money. We all want Hollywood to make money. Yeah. The problem of this is that when all of your, uh, uh, when so much of your budget goes into the marketing and promotion of a movie, it's taken away from the budget that would be spent on the development of the screenplay and the hiring of the various artists who would be making the movie. So um, that affects the art form because this is, let's face it, a very expensive art form. That's part of what's yes, beautiful about it. So at that moment, when Hollywood realized that it could buy a hit, it, it, it then shifted from making, trying to make a hit, and all into buying a hit. Yeah, and it was all about reducing risk. I mean, and you had a lot of people sitting around conference rooms making decisions who did not know a lot about movies necessarily, and who did not necessarily love movies. The way, whatever you may say about the founding studio heads of the old days, they all loved, they, were, they weren't necessarily all terribly well educated, but they loved movies and they cared about making A films. But they loved movies and they also had respect. They also being for the most part, um, you know, immigrants or the child of immigrants, really wanting to assimilate into American culture. Yes. And the way they were doing it was by making, uh, trying to make art. Now, it, that isn't to say that they knew what art was, yeah. but they knew that they wanted to be the ones to make it. Yes, that's and exactly that's right. Difference. Yeah, yeah. Um, Faye Dunaway, fascinating character. I gather you didn't talk to her, did you? No, she asked me, it was a great, uh, great moment in, in bad moments. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she asked me what her participation in the book would be. Uh, I, <laughs> she, she wanted a piece of the um, piece she, of the action. Yeah, she wanted a piece of the action, and I had to say, you know, Faye, it's not, it's not. We're not really making, you know, the Avengers <laughs> six. Uh, um, 
And I don't know how ethical that is. Um, <laughs> So what could I do? What oh, could I do? Well, she got along well with Jack, but everybody seemed to get along well with Jack, but she didn't yeah. get along so well with her director. What it, what was, can you t talk a little bit about what the friction was there? Well, well, um, no one gets along with Faye Dunaway. It should just yeah. be said up yeah. front. Faye Dunaway is, um, uh, I want to say not easy, but I know a lot of people who aren't easy. Faye Dunaway is difficult. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's not her movie to make. Yeah. It's Roman's movie to make. And right. Roman has the vision. And when Faye Dunaway doesn't like that vision, um, she complains. Now, the, the, the um, thresh, the, 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 I guess the crisis point of this came when Roman, um, reached over and plucked a hair out of Faye Dunaway's head, which was catching the light, just plucked a hair. Yeah. And she went nuts and, you know, they had to shut down, you know, she called him a tyrant, stuff like that. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> just over a little hair plucking. Yeah, a little hair plucking. It's not... <laughs> not that big a deal. And that was not Roman's first resort to try to, you know, fix the situation. Yeah. He smoothed the hair down. I realize I'm not telling the story in the right order, but he smoothed <laughs> the hair down. He tried to make it better. <laughs> it didn't work. And finally he just reached in and he's just plucked it. And uh, she, she lost, uh, she lost her mind. Oh my God. You know, one of the things you, you also uh, point out is that the effect that drugs had on both town and Evans um, and everybody, I mean, the cocaine, the the the, the fact I mean it, the, the cocaine was pretty respond well was partly responsible for really hurting Robert Towns' career going forward and wasn't good for his personal life either. Yeah, I I uh, I, I you know there there was a period before cocaine in Hollywood. Um, cocaine really started to come in around seventy, right after Chinatown, around yeah. seventy four seventy five. Um, but before cocaine, it was a you know if there were drugs on set, it would be it would be marijuana. Right. And the great director Hal Ashby was stoned all the oh, time. All the time. Yeah. So you know that, um, but it was coke that got Ashby. You know he's the perfect example of while um, pot may be freewheeling and maybe even good for the work, cocaine uh, was definitely not. Um, and that's a that's not the entire reason why this story is a sad one but it's a it's a it's a major one but it's the same with town isn't it i mean he got into it in a big yeah. way and so did yeah. evans yeah and everyone was sort of surprised that evans who was kind of persnickety that it got into it and it, it just yeah it kind evans, of hurt him. evans evans loved work and he loved sex and yeah. uh, i should say he loves seduction i think he loves seduction yeah. more than he loves sex but yeah. you know Cocaine does not go with um, work, uh, with, with quality work, you know? It goes right. with panic work, but right. it doesn't go with quality work, and it doesn't go with seduction. So it did not suit Evan's personality. Um, um, but of course, by that point, you know, he, he already had a problem. Wanted to ask about the ending. Every great movie has a great every truly great movie, every fantastic movie has a great ending. Um, and certainly Chinatown has one of the great endings, in my opinion, of all films. But, but the way, reading your book, it was obvious that the ending that we ended, that they, that they settled on was not the original ending. In fact, they didn't know what the ending was gonna be. Can you, talk, can you talk about the iterations and the considerations that went into uh, trying to figure out how to finish the picture? terms of an ending well this is a pro this is a major question it because it gets into it, it doesn't just get into storytelling and what the, the right ending for America was at that point it gets into the biographies of the people who are debating over which ending is appropriate and by that I mean town and Polanski and town um, being more inclined to um, a romantic vision of the world, um, 
wanted a sort of romantic, bittersweet uh, ending. And, and Polanski being a, a, a survivor of the Holocaust and um, a survivor of the Manson murders um, was, was, was quite convinced that there's no way that you could tell uh, uh, this kind of a story and have it end all right. Um, and so he in town fought over it. And, and um, I'm glad Polanski had his way because I also think the metaphor of Chinatown would have been compromised if there was an ending in which um, there was some kind of hope or success, you know, Chinatown represents, uh, as Town said, the futility of good intentions. So there must be total futility. There must be total annihilation. And, and that's also what makes this so significant, a metaphor in the history of American storytelling, because our whole country, um, the dream is based on agency and hope and this is futility, which is the opposite of agency and hope. So and that, it, that would have been wrecked if town had his ending, I think. As, I th as we discuss it, also, Chinatown itself was this challenge for town to figure out, well, how do I bring in Chinatown? How does it become? Because when you think about it, it's really not very much a big part of the movie until the end. You don't, you're not in Chinatown. Well, and, and Robert Evans, and this is a great story about what Hollywood used to be. Robert Evans didn't understand why this movie was called Chinatown. And, and his, <laughs> in his defense, it is confusing. The original yeah. draft of the script had no scene set in Chinatown. Yeah. He would joke, can we at least get some Chinese food in here? <laughs> Something? So the audience knows that they at least bought a ticket to the right movie. There was no... There was no, Chinatown was a state of mind in the script. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that was Town's point. Um, but, but the reason that's a significant story is because Robert Evans said, okay, anyway. Even though he didn't understand the script and even though he didn't have good reason to think that the audience would, he still said, okay, because he was betting on talent and his friends. Right, right. which is and, the mark of a great producer, frankly. Absolutely. It's really an easy job. It's, yeah. It really is an easy job because all you have to do is just have an incredible amount of courage. Yeah. And if you have that, it's, it's, it's easy. Yeah. And, 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 and you're only, only having courage in people who've already been, you know, people who you believe in. So if you can, if you can place your bets like town did, like, like Evans did, place your bets on the horses you think are going to win, uh, uh, you, have a good, you have a good deal. Yeah. But that's not the case anymore. Right. That's not the case anymore. No, uh, no, it's very different. Now it's a very hard job, a very hard job for the exact opposite reason. I did think uh, one thing that was very touching is how Nicholson was so loyal to Evans when he was sort of down and out. Because he really was down and out for a while. Yeah, Nicholson is loyalty. Nicholson, Nicholson, Nicholson is is there for you. He, you yeah. know, he will, and not just as your friend, but, um, you know, he'll if you need help with the movie, he'll he'll help write the movie. He'll he'll sit in the cutting room with you. Um, he'll get the movie made by virtue of being in it. You know, if you're his friend and he believes in you. Um, uh, he's, he's kind of the, um, he, he, he comes out pretty, pretty clean in my mind. Oh, he does. And also great sense of humor. Um, oh. that line, my favorite line was when he said to Faye Dunaway, I think, and, he, uh, he said, you know, how do you think I feel? I'm, I'm, this is my first leading man part and I got to wear, a, uh, wear a goddamn bandage for like three quarters of the movie because of his nose. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty egoless gesture. I, 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 you know, I think. Well, he wasn't. He didn't. He was beyond just being a leading man. He wasn't Warren Beatty, but he, my God, he was so good. I really think you captured 
what made him so powerful and so unique as an actor. I wish, I wish to God we saw more of him. Um, but I love, I love Jack. I did want to just show the audience, if you don't mind, my, my, my Jack. This is my Jack. Uh, I'm sorry about the reflection, but that's my Jack Nicholson autograph. Uh, obviously, that's Jake Giddis. And um, I don't know. I'm kind of glad. I know how you feel, Sam. I'm kind of glad that it wasn't a trilogy because this was originally thought of, or it's been said that it was thought of as a trilogy. There was, there, there was the two Jakes, which is not anything nice. that, yeah. But there wasn't the third one. There was going to be three of them, right? Right, right. The third one was going to be called Giddis versus Gil Giddis. And it was yeah. going to be about Giddis's divorce and, and, and no-fault divorce in California. Um, and um, it was going to be, um, and each one of the three had an element. The first one was about water. The second one was about oil, which they did make. Yeah. And and this one was going to be about the air and it was going to be about smog, you know, was going to be one of the motifs that runs through this three, three part movie about LA made, made, uh, uh, the same number of years. How am I, how am I saying this? If Jack aged 12 years in real life, the movie would be set 12 years later. Right. So kind of real time. Um, but there's no story after Chinatown. I mean, it's a lobotomy. There's no, there's nothing, there's nothing after annihilation, uh, you know. I, I, yeah, I, I, to me. Um, it, very interesting about it, Nicholson's relationship with John Huston, uh, and his reverence for John Huston, um, and then also his the relationship with Angelica. Are they still? I, I might have missed this. Are they still friends, Angelica and Jack? Do they talk or? You know, you know, my research ended at, at 1975. <laughs> so we don't know. Yeah, they didn't pay me to find that out. <laughs> but for 10 bucks, John, I'll make a couple of calls. Uh, I, I don't know. I, we I don't know, know they were together for a long time. I, I'm inclined to believe they are because that's yeah. the nature of Nicholson is to stay, yeah. stay close. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. All right. Well, now I want to open it up to some other questions, and I think I know what I need to do. We have a couple right here. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and read this. We bought your book and are just beginning to read it. We would love to know what you discovered during your research that you did not know about the movie and its creators before you started the book. Congratulations. That's from Sharon Swatos. Well, I discovered a lot. Um, the most astonishing thing was the, was the existence of a fellow by the name of Edward Taylor, um, who was Towns was 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 a man uh, Town described as his editor, which I think is a fairly euphemistic way um, to characterize someone who sits in the room every day while you write. Um, so uh, I found Edward Taylor's notes, which were pretty extensive. And um, I didn't know he existed, uh, let alone that I would have the ability to speak with his widow and his daughters and his friends and um, read some of his own emails about working uh, with Robert. Um, although he would say, I work for Robert, not with Robert, which I also think is a bit of a, um, a kindness that he pays paying his friend. And they were friends going all the way back to um, their college days when Edward Taylor would um, read all of Robert's English papers. Um, and uh, from there, they worked together on Roger Corman movies and on and on and on. So but he never got, he never got, I'm sorry, he never got credit, right? He never wanted credit. He never wanted credit. That's, that's right. He never wanted credit. Um, he wanted to collect his paycheck and Mr. Town paid him. And, um, um, you know, not have to go home with the, um, the headache that comes with having your name on something. Yeah, he's, he, he's actually a pretty smart guy or he knew what he wanted and what he didn't want. He got what he wanted. He, yeah. he, he got what he wanted. So yes, so there's a million other things 
but that was the one that was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, I never heard of Edward. I, I knew Robert Town, but I did not know Taylor. I, did, I never heard of him. Uh, okay, here's the next one, Sam. Please talk about the symbolism of Jack's cut nose and wearing bandage and wearing a bandage for the majority of the film. Um, protection from society, a mask. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? That's from Lawrence Friedman. He's nosy. That's what Polanski says to him when he's when yeah. he's um, snooping cat. around. Kitty cat, right? You're nosy, <laughs> and and what you get for being nosy is is um, in the world of Chinatown, you 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 get hit. You know, you don't yeah. you don't you don't um, you know you don't heal. You don't you don't solve the crime you become damaged you know it's yeah. bad to be nosy you don't want to look in that sense this is a really oedipal uh story you know in the sense that that you know oedipus has his eyes carved out when he learns the truth well when jack learns the truth you know he gets his nose chopped off it's not a good thing to learn the truth because it it damages you I would just add that that there's a and you brought this out too that his character Jake is a is a close horse like style likes to look good so there was a, a little bit of a, on a more superficial level a little bit of a vanity thing there this is a man who does not like to uh, uh, who wants to look his best and he does not like being uh, de basically deformed yeah that's a good point that's a good point and it's part of the story of uh, which is very subtly drawn in this movie, of Giddis starting out being a guy who has got it together and thinks he knows what the world is all about. He's cool. Yeah. But I, I, yeah. he really doesn't know the world, you know, just like all of us and the world we're living in. We, we thought N Nixon was, 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 was as w bad as it got. We thought that that was knowing the world. We thought we had seen evil, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, but then we then it gets darker. Yeah. Yeah, that's boy, something to think about. Okay. Um, from, from Claire Coletti, I know her. Um, Sam, with your skill as a writer and your knowledge of film and film history, would you ever write your own screenplay? I have done that. Ah. I have done that, I have done that and it's fun. Screenwriting is fun. Are you shopping it? I've I've, I've sold it. I've sold wow. it. Wow! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I like doing books more. I like doing books more um, um, because I'm 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 more excited about the era when uh, Hollywood was great than pushing through a a little movie to probably die in the era when Hollywood is not. Not, is not so great. That is yeah. so true. Uh, so uh, I will just throw in another question, not, certainly not off topic, but what do you ba think about the, uh, the future of movie theaters and, and watching movies communally? It's gone. I'm, I'm very dubious. I'm very you are. dubious, yeah. yes. I think we're in big trouble. And I don't, I actually don't think it's about the movie theater so much as it is about film education and, and America's sense of, of, of what is a movie, which, mm -hmm. which in the popular mind has been conflated with television. Right. And, and, and I heartily believe that these are two totally separate but related things. Yes. And we could define what a movie is, which requires a certain amount of education, then uh, I think movie theaters would come back mm -hmm. because people would understand that a movie needs to be seen in a movie theater, not just for a sentimental reason, you know, but for the same reason you need to see Guernica in, in, in the flesh right. to really see it. Um, and looking at it on a postcard is not seeing it. So, um, that missing piece is education it, 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 and, and how in the midst of what's happening in the world, 
someone is going to hold up their hand and say, excuse me, we need to, you know, we need to talk about um, David Lean. I, I, I just don't, th I, we have bigger fish to fry. But also the communal experience. I always talk about this. Uh, it's one thing for me to see a great film on my own, but when I'm seeing it in a room full of people all experiencing at the same time, that is magic. That is going to be lost. Um, and I am a little more optimistic than you are, Sam. I think that, that I think there'll be fewer movie theaters, but um, I think they will survive. Um, but, oh my God, I want to get you to Bedford to see Chinatown or the movie of your, the old movie of your choice on the big screen with a crowd uh, because it's a, it's a different experience than seeing it on your, you know, on your screen at home. For sure. And uh, it is, it is something that, uh, that makes me, that makes me very sad. So what's your next book, Sam? What, is, what are you thinking about? What are you contemplating? I'm, I'm writing a book about uh, the history of Zoetrope, um, Francis Ford Coppola's great production company, um, which I think of as the greatest undertaking in, in the history of American independent film. And uh, I, uh, I, I, uh, it's almost a, like a fairy tale, that story. And Francis has, has said yes, and so I'm getting his help on it, and that's so exciting and gratifying and wow and watching all these movies again i mean i mean talk about a movie on the big screen you cannot apocalypse now you if you don't feel that five channel and and feel it in your body i mean those helicopters yeah you feel it in your body it is not just in your ears that is an immersive uh, physical experience and you cannot, you cannot, you simply cannot have that. Yeah. Um, at at home. It's like watching watching that or Lawrence of Arabia on your iPhone. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Right. That's wrong. Well, and and what makes Francis so one of the things that makes Francis so heroic is that of course he put you know millions of his own dollars into this, and um, that's something that no director has ever put so much of their own money, gambled their livelihood. <clears throat> um, you know, it makes me wonder, where's Lucas now that, you know, movies are in danger? Where's, where's Spielberg now that movies are in danger? Where are these, I mean, Scorsese's doing his part with his film yeah. foundation, but, yeah. but um, um, I don't know, where, where, where are those guys? Yeah, you think about the, the, the feature film. What I say to my, my uh, young people, they're not that young, they're in their late 20s, early 30s. But I say to them, if you watch 10 feature films, you have 10 different stories, 10 different experiences. If you watch a Netflix series, it's fantastic. And I watch Netflix series too. You're taking the same amount of time and it's telling you one story. It's a longer story, it's longer form. It can be fantastic but love the feature film because they're contained stories. And for the same amount of time, you can experience so much more variety and, and walk in different shoes and all those different things. So yes, I, so who I directed hope your favorite episode of Netflix television. It's very hard to know. I mean, I yeah. don't know, yeah. you know, it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't matter who the director is in television. Uh, yeah. You know, we can all name the directors of our favorite movies, but the directors of our favorite television, is, it doesn't matter. And, and if you believe as I do that the director makes the art form, yeah. and that tells you right there um, that something is seriously wrong in, uh, in, in, in television. I, well, the other thing that I lament is uh, the sense of history. I mean, I, I really have worked hard with my own children, again, they're older, to teach them to say, listen, you don't all, you know, don't say, I will never watch a black and white movie. I will never watch a black and white movie. Are you kidding me? You have to watch black and white movies. There's certain black and white movies. Children are saying that? You have, kids say that, young people say it. Send them to me. Oh, I will believe Send you, Sam, I'm sending them, because it is, it's an issue, and you really have to, 
uh, push to get them to watch certain things and expose them early for them to have any sense of the history of movie making. I mean, it's one of the proudest achievements uh, in America, yeah. the last hundred years of movie making. I agree with you. And, and if people, if they're not even aware of it or say, no, I won't, you know, I'm not gonna watch anything before 1980, you're, you're, you're missing a lot. Particularly comedies, I have to say, the great comedies, many of the greatest comedies were made earlier on, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Uh, so I'm gonna see now whether we have some more questions. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, hold on just a second. Please articulate more fully how the film is representative of complete annihilation. Is it simply that evil always wins out? Yes. I mean, corruption, you can't fight City Hall is what this movie is about. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. Okay, on the topic of zoetrope, can you discuss any relationship between Chinatown and Godfather 1 and 2? Well, they were both made at, they're all made at Paramount, all under Robert Evans. Um, yeah. Sound stages right across from each other. Um, period uh, pictures, the period pictures. Yeah, but I mean, it goes <laughs> to show you, it goes to show you that this was, that, that we're not being sentimental or nostalgic yeah. or curmudgeonly uh, or elitist to say that there used to be a Hollywood. We're talking about Godfather 1, Godfather 2, and Chinatown, just three of the movies to come out of Paramount in a you know, few year period. These are not esoteric works of art. These are popular works of art made in a studio uh, in, in Hollywood. So what they have in common is that they're Paramount movies. They're Bob yeah. Evans movies, which is an important point. Yeah. The, um, the conversation, uh, was that, uh, that wasn't Paramount, was it? It was Paramount. It was part of a deal that Paramount struck with uh, what was called the Directors Company, which was a partnership between Coppola, Friedkin, and Bogdanovich. Um, and um, they were- That didn't really work out, did it? <laughs> Well, it didn't really, well, I don't know. It depends what you mean by work out because it did give us Paper Moon. Yes. And it did give us the conversation. Yeah. And it gave us Daisy Miller, which I don't think really works, but I think no. the fact that it exists means that the studio was working. Yeah, yeah. It's just what I meant by that was it was one of those lovely utopian ideas that, would, that you can look back and say, oh, that never could have lasted um, because it's such a lovely idea. Let's see these brilliant people we're going to give you limited budgets, but you have complete creative control. Well, that that that's not so. That wasn't so unusual, mm -hmm. you know. In 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 a period of Hollywood, um, it was just it was just never, it was just never stated as such, you know. Well, they gave it to Orson Welles, and then they said, "We'll never do that again." <laughs> well, that's not, not, that's another time. That's another time, but. You know, in, in, in the, you know, when Arthur Freed was producing at MGM, th there was no e reasonable expense spared, no. you know? Um, no. all, the great the producers, all the great producers know that. Sam, Sam Spiegel, you know, they all, they all would not, they all would work the way the director's company worked. Yeah. And in fact, the reason it went down is because Friedkin never made his movie. And because it was based on a profit sharing model, the two other guys said, Billy, you know, <laughs> you're taking our money. So the, the damage wasn't between the studio and the filmmakers, it was amongst the filmmakers themselves. What was the, did Freakin have a project that he wanted to make? Or I, I, I missed that bit. I don't know how far he got, I'm sure he did, but he never, he never made a movie for the director's company. Yeah. I mean, you know, French Connection, I think, is one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, and Exorcist is pretty good, too. So he made some good, made some good pictures. Okay, here we go from Vincent LaRusso. Does, do you have a favorite movie, Sam? And if so, did that help you in the writing of books? 
I but, have a lot of favorite movies. Um, um, I don't know if it helps me in the writing of books. Nothing helps you in the writing of books. <laughs> Nothing. Um, uh, no, but I have a, I have, um, I have favorite directors, you know? I have, I can list favorite directors easier than I could favorite movies. Billy Wilder's a favorite director. I'm looking at my yep. shelf right now. Howard Hawks, John Cassavetes, um, Polanski. Um, Bob Fosse. No love for John Lubitsch. Ford. Lubitsch. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, John, like John Ford, I don't respond to emotionally. I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand John Ford. So it's hard to get that excited about. What about George Cukor? Cukor, I get. I wouldn't put him up there with the other with the other ones. Yeah, but yeah. I'm I'm always happy to be in his company. Yeah, so, uh, Preston Sturgis. I I I, I yeah, I, I, a great time. I, he he doesn't transcend like like the other ones. Um, um, uh, a Sturgis movie, you know. Uh, uh, I know this is sacrilege, but. Um, I don't think that they are very, uh, I think that they're th fun, but you know, not so mature. Well, they're certainly not mature. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think they're, they're intended to be mature. I, when we talk about Billy Wilder, my movie That's, is, yeah. my, my movie is The Apartment. Uh, right. That movie breaks my heart. And I will tell you something, I've always been uh, amazed that people refer to it as a comedy. I, I don't see The Apartment as a comedy at all has comedic moments or elements, but it is a very serious drama, really. It's, it's a, a romance. It's a serious drama, drama with, with, funny, with funny moments. Yeah, drama, with funny it's moments. drama with a nebbish. And that we showed at the Bedford Playhouse in a 4K digital print, and it looked really good. And I, again, and I'll tell you, the, the, you know how when you see these great movies again and then again and again, you see new things, Yes. Robert Altman said that to me. He said, you always, it's better to see a great movie again than an average one the first time. Because even though you've seen it before, you see, always see something new. And what I saw the last time was that Shirley MacLaine. Oh my, I've right. always seen her, but that, boy, was she good in that movie. You want to see great Shirley MacLaine, see Some Came Running by Minnelli with Sinatra. Oh, very that, good. Yes. Yeah. 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 Beautifully yeah. shot too. Beautifully yeah. shot and a great performance of, from uh, Dean Martin. Great. Yeah. Those great. are the movies we got to celebrate. There's no question about it. Uh, well, you going to be John? If you don't mind my jumping in, we have a question that was submitted by email. So can I read this to you? Oh yes. Go ahead, Dan. Okay. So uh, this person actually, there's two very quick questions that were submitted by e email uh, a couple minutes ago. Uh, the first one is. Um, is there any significance to Polanski being the one who cuts Jack's nose? And then uh, the second question is, uh, can you talk about the casting of John Huston? He seems so perfect in the role. Was anyone else ever considered for it? Um, oh, yes. Now, I, um, I don't think seriously. I think it was pretty much Houston all the way. Um, and um, the, the slitting of, uh, Ro Roman slitting Jack's nose, that was just an opportunity for Roman to terrorize Jack, uh, <laughs> uh, which they had a good time doing. Jack was a little nervous. Yes, he was very nervous because um, Roman had to invent that prop, that, that switchblade and it was hinged on one side. So if Roman went in and nicked him with the other side, it wouldn't give and could therefore really cut Jack's nose. And Roman would torture him, torture him. <laughs> well, so that's the, there's no significance, no story significance. It was just two friends, um, you know, needling each other. He was he was very good, Polanski. Really, when you see him, he sort of Polanski's an actor. Polanski yeah. is, is an is an actor. You know, I mean, um, um, 
what an amazing, you know, people think, you know, if he, if he were just a director, he'd be a giant, but he was an actor and a fabulous writer, you know, a yeah. great, great screenwriter, yeah. uh, Roman. I and, didn't know until your book, Sam, I didn't know how much of that script was, was Roman Polanski's. Um, yeah. He was amazing. Well, and I always remember, uh, those of you out there, if you want to uh, see Roman Polanski's first feature, uh, Knife in the Water uh, is still an amazing film. I saw it a couple of years ago again. This says uh, triangle on a boat and, uh, you know, lots of uh, foreboding. Um, he was a, a genius without any question. He still is. Yeah, he really, he is. He's still a genius. And I hear his new film is one of his best, is one of his best movies. I haven't seen it, of course. It doesn't have a release here, but people who I know have seen it say it's one of his best movies. So are we going to be able to see it or is it not? I, I, I was talking to people who say they're, they're trying to work on it, but I don't know. It's, a, it's about the Dreyfus affair. Yeah. Uh, um, um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, we will hope so. I'm trying to see if there's anything else I've got here. Um, I think we've, uh, I think we've covered everything. Now we can go back and, and, and look at real life and all the amazing things that are happening in our world right now. Out there in Chinatown. It's, it's almost as dramatic as Chinatown. Mm -hmm. I was about mm -hmm. to say that. Well, Sam, I want to thank you. It's been so delightful meeting you, and Thanks, uh, and you and I are gonna are gonna stay in touch if you don't mind, please, um, because we love the same things. And uh, I get out to L.A., and I'm sure you get to New York every now and again. I do. Uh, so it's wonderful. Thank you for this great book. And, thank and, you, and ladies and gentlemen. Really, do 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 uh, read all his stuff. I mean. They're all, they're all great. They really are all great. But The Big Goodbye is absolutely fabulous. And I also really love Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m. Darling, Audrey Hepburn and Blake Edwards and all those. I mean, that, that movie, which we also showed at the Playhouse, and everyone's crying and the Henry Mancini score. I mean, it's all, you know, it's amazing. So thank you for celebrating it. And thank you for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you for bringing people together. Absolutely. Okay, Sam, we'll be in touch. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.